those police agencies have essentially no constitutional status. You won't find the word police in the U.S. Constitution. And the ability of the people themselves to exercise sovereignty, or even to threaten to exercise sovereignty, right? How do you keep usurpers in line by the threat that if they start usurping, the people are going to take direct action against them? All of that has been removed from the system in practice, not in principle, because it's all there still in principle. There hadn't been an amendment of the Constitution to change any of this. They have just surreptitiously or foolishly created alternative institutions which have, by accretion or absorption, gained these powers which should be in the hands of the people themselves. And so as a result of this, now Virginia is an example, actually many states are an example of this, now we see the attempt to eliminate entirely the ability of the people to function as militia. They want to disarm them completely. Whereas if you go to the Constitution and say, oh, wait a minute, the the arms that we're talking about here are ones that are conducive to a well-regulated militia, there's basically no category of arms that couldn't perform that function. And that's the end of the game for the gun controllers. And that's why the gun controllers never bring this up. That's why the gun controllers are as much reticent about bringing up the case of the United States versus Miller, for instance. They don't want to talk about that. Because as soon as you start talking about militia and common defense, and you start looking about at, at the history just in the 20th century of what was used for the common defense or what could be used today for various aspects of militia service, the gun control argument falls apart completely. Uh, so we're talking about a century. We've lost an entire century in truly progressive social organization in this country. And we've let the crazies, the Marxists, the most failed political philosophy in the history of the world, take over our educational system, dominate our political system, dominate our media, and then we wonder why things are going to hell in a handbasket without the handbasket. Welcome back to Finance and Liberty and Reluctant Preppers. We have a distinguished returning guest, Dr. Edwin Vieira, Ph.D. and J.D., is a constitutional attorney. He's also a prolific author of both books and numerous articles about the Second Amendment and about rights to keep and bear arms and about our misunderstandings about that and why it's leading us further and further uh, to drift in towards uh, tyranny and usurpation rather than retaining the liberty that we are due by our Constitution. Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us again here. It's my pleasure to be with you. We, we want to get to uh, a quick summary by you of your book called By Tyranny Out of Necessity, The Unconstitutionality of Martial Law. But first, if you could hit some high points for us on what we're learning from the developments in the state of Virginia, which has been in the news for the past quarter or so, with a popular uprising across many counties of the state and a, a seemingly a clash of, of wills uh, uh, culminating at the Capitol grounds and now a flurry of, of bills that are being proposed and either pushed through or, or re- repealed um, that would potentially uh, dramatically affect people's rights to keep and bear arms in the state of Virginia. What do we know about uh, what's going on there, and what do people need to be aware of, sort of what they're not being told on the mainstream news, but from your more studied view? The first thing I think is that hubris is a very dangerous state of mind. The Democrats uh, won the elections in 2019, and they already, in, in, in the General Assembly, the Virginia legislature, they already, of course, had the governor, attorney general, lieutenant governor. They had already been elected. And they thought that they could push through a very comprehensive and radical set of gun control laws on the basis of having these relatively narrow but sufficient majorities in the General Assembly. So no sooner was the election over then they began putting up what they call pre-filed legislation. That is, the bills that were going to be filed when the legislature came into session, and they would put them up early in the pre-filing status, so apparently they would get them ahead on the calendars. 
And, of course, people looked at these bills, really radical. One of the the first ones that came up, I think the first one that came up, was a bill that was going to outlaw so-called assault firearms, which would include almost every AR-type, AK-type, and very many other semi-automatic firearms that had detachable magazines. And a sleeping giant was suddenly awakened, and a so-called Second Amendment sanctuary movement spread across the state in which local jurisdictions, boards of supervisors, town councils, so forth, passed resolutions stating that they would refuse to exercise their powers to enforce any unconstitutional gun control legislation, Mm -hmm. anything that violated the Second Amendment or the equivalent provision of the Virginia Constitution, which is Article 1, Section 13. And this spread across the state. I think there are over 100 of these local jurisdictions that have signed on to the Second Amendment sanctuary movement. Now, that shocked the Democrats. And they began backpedaling. So that bill that I mentioned, uh, they changed that from absolute prohibition to, uh, well, you can keep your assault firearms, but you have to register them sometime in the future, way 2021, January of 2021. And even that was insufficient. A number of Democrats um, turned on them, turned on the party, and voted in the Senate against that particular bill. So at the present time, that particular bill looks as if it is dead until the next legislative session, legislative session next year. But they'll, they'll attempt to revivify it. I mean, it's like Dracula coming out of, the, out of his uh, you know, coffin. At, at darkness, they'll uh, they'll bring that in again. Uh, they have red flag law. Uh, they had laws dealing with uh, the so-called two guns a month. You can only buy two mm-hmm. handguns a month, and this type of thing. So some of those will be passed. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the pro Second Amendment uh, constituency, if you will, has really been mobilized far beyond what I think anyone even people friendly to that constituency imagined would happen. So that's number one. Uh, Number two, it's become apparent that the Democrats obtained their majority in the last election to a large extent from carpetbag money. Mr. Bloomberg and others who were funding various gun control uh, lobbying groups and uh, political action groups uh, targeted specific Uh, candidates, specific uh, electoral districts that they thought they could, as the expression goes, flip from Republican to Democrat. Mm -hmm. And they were able to change the composition of the the legislature on that basis. I think the the figures are that the the, the Bloomberg-related monies were eight times as large as the money spent by the NRA. And, of course, everyone thinks of the NRA as the premier Second Amendment lobbying organization, political action organization. So, uh, obviously, they were unaware or they didn't pay enough attention uh, to what Mr. Bloomberg was doing. And he's a multi-billionaire, so he can afford to finance this uh, to whatever level he likes. So that's another area. People are now aware, more so than in the past, that these elections are not something that have only local involvement or local effect. That we saw in Virginia, the Bloombergization of the gun control movement, men coming in with huge amounts of money from outside of the state and is simply buying certain elections. So people are going to become aware of that. And I think at the next election, that's a question that will be asked of essentially any candidate. Are you receiving money from, and there will be a laundry list of Bloomberg, Soros, and various organizations that are funded by those people. If you're receiving money from those people, we're not going to vote for you. You're out. You're gone. Uh, And I think something else that most people don't, pay too much attention to. Here in Virginia, as I think in probably most states, uh, a legislative position is not a full-time occupation. You have people running for the legislature who are lawyers, they may be car dealers, they real estate agents, who knows what. They have some other career mm-hmm. that supports them, and they spend a certain amount of time in the legislature, sometimes many terms, to be sure, 
but only for that short period of time when the legislature is in session and receiving this relatively small compensation for performing those services as legislators. Well, those people have to go back home where their economic constituents as well as their political constituents are. And I can imagine that there will be a lot of repercussions in terms of individuals' economic situations, the car dealer, the, uh, the, the furniture salesman, whatever it is, who was prominent as a gun control legislator. He's going to find that he's going to have some difficulties economically with his uh, other career. And the big picture is that Virginia has awakened the rest of the country. This is what could happen in Kentucky, in Tennessee, certainly in Texas. Texas is moving further and further in the direction of of flipping from being a red state to a blue state. And the pro-Second Amendment people are becoming much more aware, much more suspicious of what's going on in the political realm, uh, much more concerned with organizing themselves. And finally, the Second Amendment sanctuary concept has created the um, the model, really, here in Virginia, the model for the rest of the country by which local jurisdictions can uh, interpose themselves. I guess that's the correct t- term here. Interpose themselves against the central state governments when the central state governments begin to take actions that are clearly in violation of uh, the Second Amendment or other constitutional rights of that matter. And that's something that we haven't seen for a very, very long time. You've seen the Second Amendment, excuse me, the Sanctuary Cities uh, movement with respect to illegal immigration. But those Sanctuary Cities were, or, or Sanctuary jurisdictions, some of them were states, were actually attempting to nullify, in effect, legitimate federal laws. There's no question that Congress has authority to pass laws dealing with immigration, and there's no question that the laws they have passed are constitutional, at least they have never been challenged in the Supreme Court effectively. So here you had the sanctuary cities and sanctuary states movement that was essentially saying, well, we don't care that those laws are constitutional. We're simply not going to cooperate with the federal government in seeing that they be enforced. This is exactly the opposite of what's happened in Virginia. This sanctuary Second Amendment movement is directed towards effectuating the Constitution against unconstitutional actions by, in this case, the state government. And I think that will come up in the red flag laws, but most people are familiar with red flag laws. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the model is someone comes and complains to a local uh, uh, prosecutor's office or the local police, local sheriff, that an individual is uh, a danger to himself or others. Uh, the court issues an ex parte order, that is an order without that, victim being apprised of what's happening. Uh, The police or the sheriff show up at his home, sees whatever firearms he has, and then sometime in the future he gets to contest all of this on the basis that he really is not a threat to himself or or others. Uh, Those types of statutes have been passed in quite a number of states, and they've raised a certain amount of controversy because of all the constitutional violations that are built into them, due process violations, Mm -hmm. basically. the problem with dealing with those statutes is typically they require a victim. Someone ends up being the subject of one of these ex parte orders, and then he turns around and he challenges the statute in some way. Now, some of those people will only go so far as to try and get their firearms back. Some of them might challenge the statute as being unconstitutional. Uh, but you're talking about an individual who has to get a lawyer and pay the money and go through all this process and so forth. And some of those individuals, by the way, are what you might consider to be unsavory plaintiffs. Maybe they do have a history of mental illness. Maybe they do have a history of making threats against you know, members of their family or, or others. So they're, they're not sympathetic, if you know what I mean, uh, as, as uh, champions of questioning those laws. But here in Virginia now, we have a number of local prosecutors and a number of local law enforcement people who are on record as saying they're not going to enforce Mm -hmm. these unconstitutional laws, red flag laws being one of that set. And so I can imagine a situation where a number of prosecutors and police bring a declaratory judgment action attacking the whole bloody statute 
on the basis of its violations of due process, its violations of the Second Amendment, its violations of the First Amendment. I mean, most people don't realize that, that some of these uh, complaints that would be made would be made on the basis of what A heard B say, all right? And the Supreme Court has ruled on a number of occasions that abstract advocacy, even of violence, is protected by the First Amendment. If you stand up in a soapbox and say, we should all go down and burn the Capitol, well, that's abstract advocacy. That's protected. If you start handing out torches to people to march to the Capitol, that's incitement to violence, and that can be prohibited and punished. So I can imagine a number of these red flag situations where someone is repeating to the court, what he heard the the target say, which actually is a First Amendment protected statement. So it's not just the Second Amendment that's involved here. It's not just the due process clause that's involved here, notice, hearing, right to an attorney, and so forth. It may be First Amendment questions that are involved. I mean, these statutes are just full of constitutional problems. And what we may see is some of the, in Virginia, some of these law enforcement people and prosecutors saying, well, we can't enforce these. Because of all these problems. And if we do, especially the law enforcement people, because they have no real immunity. Prosecutors tend to have immunity, but law enforcement people don't. They say, well, if we enforce these, we're going to be subject to civil rights statute uh, violations brought against us. So we have standing to challenge this. And I think that would be amazing if that were to happen. And it very well may. So all sorts of interesting things have occurred um, in Virginia. Some of these statutes will be enacted, and then they'll be challenged. Some of them apparently are dead for now. And what is not dead for now is this groundswell of uh, popular awareness and organization, which we haven't seen in the past. And the final point is what, what's going on in a number of counties is people are starting to talk about, in some way or other, organizing militia groups. Officially, all right, militia groups that are sponsored by the local jurisdictions, or if they're not calling them militia groups, they may call them something else, uh, emergency preparedness or whatever groups, so that the local citizens become directly involved in this process on a essentially permanent basis, not simply every couple of years when the elections come up. And that's something that, from my point of view, I find uh, I won't say surprising under the circumstances, but gratifying, because I've been trying to get people to do that for years. Right? This kind of a local organization, and then once a local organization has been tested out, taking that to the state legislature and revamping the uh, essentially moribund militia laws that you find in essentially every state in the country. So we may be seeing a number of, uh, what's the expression, sea changes in this area, and most of them will be for the good. Because I think the, the, the Democrats, the, the gun controllers, have recognized that even if they win an election and gain a su- uh, sufficient majority to think they can pass this kind of legislation, the groundswell of opposition to them will result in, well, in this, this particular case, some members of their own party voting against the, uh, the party's agenda. I think that surprised Governor Northam. He was he was surprised by the out. They had a, a huge rally on the 20th of January, so-called Lobby Day in Virginia, pro Second Amendment rally. And I think the the size of that rally and the the absence of any kind of uh, improper behavior uh, really surprised, it shocked the Democrats. And then, of course, the Second Amendment sanctuary movement told them, "Oh my goodness." There's a huge amount of opposition to this below the surface. And as a result of that, a number of Democrats, I think four Democrats were were enough to change their votes, go against the party, to eliminate, at least this year, the assault firearms ban. Which was the, that was the apex, that was the the, the keynote, the the key piece of legislation they, they wanted to pass. Outlaw what they call assault firearms. And it's failed. So it's very positive. I mean, the, the election obviously was negative, and the, the ability of these people, the Bloombergites, to come in with large amounts of money and, and uh, sway 
uh, the voters and, and create this situation, obviously, is not desirable. But the consequence of it is, and I think we're going to see more of that. And, and as I said, they've awakened the sleeping giant, not just in Virginia, but all over the country. It reminds me of during the Obama years when there was uh, such a, uh, a lot of talk from the administration about this, these similar topics about uh, so-called assault weapons and so on and high, high capacity magazines and so on. And sales of those items had never, the, in, the, in the entire administration was, had never been higher. It was breaking records every year. And then they have the opposite when Donald Trump got elected. They call it the Trump slump because some of these companies are actually filing for bankruptcy because when, uh, when they, the populace sense the lack of lack of immediate threat or imminent you know, opposition from, from the government, then, then back to complacency we go. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic that you're pointing out, that sometimes when it becomes clear that you're about to lose your rights, that's when the, uh, the sort of the ground swell of, of populist resistance arises. And I think they've learned from the, the, the old slogan, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. All right. You can't allow that complacency to come in every two years just because you've won the last election, just because Virginia had had a pro-Second uh, Amendment legislature for I don't know how long, very long, as long as I've lived here almost. Uh, but here's what happens. People were complacent. Take the NRA as an example. They didn't spend as much money, anywhere near as much money as Bloomberg did. They weren't aware of what was going on. They weren't paying attention. And the next thing, the... The average Virginian, the ordinary Virginian, discovered was that he had a gun control, serious gun control problem in Richmond and had to deal with it. And thank goodness they came out of the woodwork, as it were, and did deal with it on the basis of some very quick organization by the Virginia Citizens Defense League, essentially, which is kind of the premier local uh, lobbying and political action organization for gun rights. But what I hope will come out of this uh, eventually is a recognition that the only way to stifle gun control is by returning to the correct interpretation and application of the Second Amendment and actually some provisions of the original Constitution dealing with the militia. Because if we look at the gun control, uh, what shall I say, their, their, their flagship legislation in every state going through Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, Maryland, now into Virginia, has been some kind of prohibition or registration coupled with prohibition, whatever, of what they call assault firearms. Mm -hmm. And the assault firearm is typically the AR-15 type rifle, which differs from the military version primarily, I would say functionally, solely, that the civilian, so-called civilian version is semi-automatic and the military versions are fully automatic or automatic or burst fire. Uh, although the military seems to be getting away from the, you know, that type of you know, shoot and pray uh, approach to use of firearms. But in any event, if you look at those firearms, they are the quintessential militia firearms. They're exactly the thing that the average member of a militia could be trained to use effectively, safely, uh, for whatever the particular purposes uh, of, of his service would be that required firearms usage. And we see that simply because you see more and more police are carrying mm -hmm. AR-15s as well as their slight action shotguns and, and semi-automatic pistols. Uh, it, it's become ubiquitous. Now, if you look at the way people uh, on both sides deal with those firearms, the, the gun controllers say, well, those firearms are, quote-unquote, weapons of war. They're, the distinction between the AR-15 and the M-16 or whatever is very, very small, and, all right, so that they should be banned on that basis. Now, of course, if you look at the at the original Constitution, which talks about the Congress having the power to call forth the militia, uh, what's the third purpose? Execute the laws of the union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So you would think that 
militia would need to have, quote-unquote, weapons of war to repel invasions, because it's pretty obvious that the Chinese women's army would not be coming over here with slingshots. Right? They would be uh, equipped with the latest small arms. But that's the argument that has been made by the gun controllers. We don't want weapons of war on the streets. Well, forget the streets. We certainly want weapons of war in the hands of the militia. On the other side, we have the people who are uh, pro-Second Amendment, and they make the argument, basically, in fact, it's the only one I've ever seen them. they make, that the AR-15s are useful for personal defense. And modern hunting Home rifles, defense. they call them, yeah. Well, modern sporting rifles, right. they call it. Right. Modern sporting right. rifles. But the, the argument eventually comes down not to sport, not to hunting, but to personal defense. Personal defense and the yeah. reason they say that is because they have the Heller and McDonald decisions. Heller and McDonald decisions said that the average American has the right to have a firearm in common use in his community, which is in common use in his community, for use as a personal defense tool. All right? Okay. And you can argue back and forth the extent to which those rifles are really going to be effective and for personal defense in one's home, home right, uh, as opposed to a handgun. But that argument is one that, the personal defense argument, is one that really doesn't resonate, if you will, with the language of the Second Amendment, or certainly the history of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment talks about a well-regulated militia being necessary to secure a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, obviously, the purpose of that amendment is the free state. That's what we're trying to preserve. And the well-regulated militia is necessary to that security. And therefore, you want people to have the right to keep and bear arms. What arms? The arms that would enable them to function in a well-regulated militia so as to secure their free state. That's the goal. And if you look at the relationship of the Second Amendment to the original Constitution, well, the original Constitution actually talks about the militia, doesn't it? Congress has the power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, calling the militia forth for three particular purposes. And these are the militia of what? The militia of the several states. Today there are 50 of them, supposedly. So that's the interaction, constitutionally speaking. They put the Second Amendment in for the purpose of making sure that the original provisions of the Constitution dealing with the militia would not be misconstrued or abused. See, most people don't realize, if, if you look at the Bill of Rights, the, there was a preamble to it when they sent the Bill of Rights to the states for ratification. The preamble said, well, we're giving you these, or this list of, of rights so as to prevent misconstruction or abuse of the powers that already exist in the original Constitution. Well, what's misconstruction? Misconstruction is misinterpretation. I make a mistake. I don't read the thing correctly. Right? And we certainly don't want that to happen. Abuse is, I read it or I misread it intentionally, either to increase the powers of Congress or the executive branch, let's say, or perhaps to decrease them. All right? And the Second Amendment was designed, along with the other Bill of Rights, to prevent those misconstructions or abuses. So... What is it directed towards? Well, it's directed towards the militia provisions of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. Right? We don't want those things to be misinterpreted. And the way they might be misinterpreted would be to create some kind of uh, unique, special militia, uh, exclusive militia made up of only of certain groups of people. Right? And so the Second Amendment says, well, the people in general, right? the right of the people without qualification to keep and bear arms. That's what Congress is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be organizing, arming, disciplining, training the people as a whole. And that's, of course, what the states have to do as well, because the states cannot undermine the militia. That would undermine Congress's ability to call forth the militia to perform the three national functions. So it all ties together. So if you're going to make the argument with respect to any particular firearm, you would say, well, number one, is this firearm conducive in the hands of the people, the average person, for service in a well-regulated militia that would protect, ultimately, the security of a free state? And the answer to that is, well, probably any firearm, that's modern firearm, that you could imagine would fit that standard. Bolt-action rifle would fit that standard. 
Semi-automatic pistol would fit that standard. Revolver would fit that standard. AR-15, AK-47 type rifle would fit that standard. Because at one time or another, certainly in the 20th century, they have all been used as military or paramilitary and still are being used to a large extent as military and paramilitary arms in militia-type settings, that is, in the hands of people who are not professional soldiers. And many of those arms are also being used by the professional soldiers. The difference between the AR-15 and the M-16 is very, very slight in terms of its functionality. So that would be the correct, to me it seems, the correct argument. We come up against some gun control bill that says, well, we're going to outlaw, require registration or something or other of this Mm -hmm. class of firearms. You say, well, wait a minute. Is this a class of firearms that could be used by people for militia functions? Answer, yes. Well, then the Second Amendment protects them, and you can't prohibit their possession. You can't outlaw, you can't require registration, whatever the list, the laundry list of gun control requirements may be. You can't do any of those things. And interestingly enough, that was already decided by the Supreme Court in the Miller case, 1930s where the question arose whether a short-barreled shotgun was protected under the Second Amendment. Now, the court didn't decide that question because it didn't have any evidence before. It said, we can't judicially determine this without having actual evidence. We can't, we can't use what's called judicial notice. Judicial notice is when the court takes notice of a fact that is unquestionable. The sun rises every day in the east. That's unquestionable. All right, They can take judicial notice of that. They can take judicial notice that the city of New York is on the Hudson River, things along that line. But they couldn't take judicial, so they said, they couldn't take judicial notice of whether a short-barreled shotgun could perform a militia function. But they did say, the standards that they set out was exactly that. If the firearm could perform that function, of contributing to the common defense, then it was protected by the Second Amendment, period. Right. Right? There was no limitation that could be imposed. Common defense is the standard. So you look at essentially all of the firearms that these various gun controllers want in some way to regulate, prohibit, require register, whatever they are. So you're talking the the semi-automatic handgun that can take uh, a magazine with more than 10 rounds, so so the so-called high-capacity magazine, right? They want to ban the more than Mm -hmm. 10-round magazine. Well, can a semi-automatic firearm (laughs) with a magazine of more than 10 rounds contribute to the common defense? Absolutely. Well, of course it can. That's what the Army carries. That's what the Marine carries. That's what the, the Navy SEALs carry. That's what the police today carry in almost every jurisdiction, right? Now, if we go back to some of the earlier firearms, the, the you know, revolver, no problem there. Right? Obviously, the gun controllers are not trying to ban those. The shotgun, the bolt-action rifle, and so forth and so on. And so the, the, the difficulty here is that the people who are making the Second Amendment, pro-Second Amendment arguments are not making those arguments coming from the right constitutional direction. But I think even more important than that for people who are, quote-unquote, preppers, if you will, is the pro-Second Amendment camp does not recognize that the real goal, constitutional goal, is not for John Doe to have an AR-15 rifle in his cellar and a bunch mm-hmm. of 30-round magazines and a 1,000 rounds of mm-hmm. you know, 5.56 NATO ammunition. That's not the real goal, to have him defending himself as an individual. Because if you're talking about defending yourself against tyranny as an individual, you're living in a fantasy world. Tyrants do not go by themselves to oppress people. They send armed thugs to do it, usually large numbers of armed thugs. And in order to oppose any tyranny worthy of the name, the people have to be organized, armed, trained, and disciplined to a certain degree. And that's the militia concept. And besides the opposition to tyranny, Militia would perform all sorts of other functions relating to various kinds of emergencies, natural disasters, execution. I think of execution of the laws as your classic example of this because today because you look at many police departments, paramilitarized police departments, which see themselves as being opposed in some way to the general citizenry. 
right? It's kind of the us-them mentality of these modern police departments. And as a result, you have incidences of uh, police brutality, uh, uh, police excesses of one kind or another, uh, which generally are not dealt with by the prosecutorial authorities, because the prosecutorial authorities tend to be in bed with the police. You know, they need the police, and the police need them, as it were, to, to do what they want to do. If the militia were the organizations that were enforcing local laws, these problems, to a very large extent, I think, would disappear. Because who are the militia? Well, they're, they're the average people who are living there, right? The ones that would be in the police component, obviously, would be have, would have to have specialized training and receive uh, salaries and so forth. So, like the Minutemen during the colonial era or the War of Independence era, but they would still be part of this larger structure, which was community based, made up of members of the community, organized on that along those lines. And so we would see a lot of uh, what I would call the irresponsibility of these police agencies would disappear because the members of those agencies would realize in one way or another that they were subject to scrutiny and control by their neighbors. They were not some kind of independent, aloof organization that could get away with almost anything as long as they pleased the local prosecutor. For another reason, because the local prosecutor would be a member of the militia, too. So, I mean, <laughs> the thing would be a self, self-policing uh, operation, if you will. And, and that, in my mind, is the real goal here. Because if you think of, of the concept of a free state, the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the Second Amendment, we're going to maintain this thing called a free state. Well, what is that constitutionally? Well, actually, it's defined earlier in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, Republican form of government. Think of the, the term of free state in English. To, to the German equivalent is the single word Freistaat, free state. And it is generally translated as republic. Right? So the Second Amendment is really looking to maintaining institutions that will support a republican form of government. Well, what is a republican form of government? There are two components to it. The one that most people think of, which is a, uh, one of lesser importance, is that the people choose representatives to go to the various governmental bodies to act on their behalf, unlike a democracy in which the people themselves exercise the governmental bodies, like New England town meetings. Right? Every member of the town who was entitled to vote would come to the meeting and they would have discussion and they would vote on the various proposals that were put forth for the town. Uh, so they think of it as representative government. Republican form of government is a representative government. Okay, that's fine. But the underlying conception is a, rep- a Republican form of government is one in which the people themselves exercise, control, enjoy the ultimate sovereignty. The people are the sovereigns. Right? Well, sovereignty ultimately falls back on the ability to exercise force. Mm-hmm. That group within society that has the ability to exercise sufficient force to control all other groups is the sovereign. And that could be a standing army, a Praetorian guard type situation, think of the Roman Roman Empire. Or it could be uh, uh, these professional police forces. Or it could be, as the Constitution requires the people themselves, and the people themselves have to be organized in some way, and that, of course, is a militia structure. And if you look at that historically, you'll find all the way back to the colonial charters provisions for exactly that, organizing, arming, training all of the people, other than, of course, the slaves, because you had slavery in this country before the Constitution was written, uh, but that was the concept, and that continued through the 1700s, and it continued at least on paper through the 1800s, but it began to atrophy because people lost interest in performing their militia duties. They didn't see a reason to do it. There were no particular threats 
that they thought could be solved only by the militia. And so they allowed power to flow away from the true sovereigns into these various political institutions which were controlled, dominated, or what have you, by someone else. Mm -hmm. And then in 1903, they begin to create the thing called the National Guard, and people now begin to look at the National Guard as if that is the militia, when in fact it isn't. The National Guard's an adjunct of the Army. It comes under a different, completely different provision of the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. It's the troops or ships of war which the states may keep in time of peace with the consent of Congress. And that's clear if you actually go back to 1903 and see what they were saying and talking about and how they were characterizing what they were doing. But the result of it is we have an army, a standing army, at the national level. We have these little standing armies called the National Guard at the state level, which are part and parcel of the national standing army, if they're called up to perform those functions. You know, think of World War II, think of Korea, think of, uh, of Vietnam, mm -hmm. right? the involvement of the National Guard there. Uh, certainly was not something that the militia were ever designed to do, either in practice or constitutionally speaking. So we have those, and then at the state and local level, we have these various police agencies which are performing at least two of those functions, execution of the laws and suppression of insurrections, right? And I suppose they would be called upon to repel invasions if that were to happen. Okay. Well, those police agencies have essentially no constitutional status. You won't find the word police in the U.S. Constitution. There's the militia, but not the police. They developed much later, you're talking about the early part of the 1800s, I think it was 1830 something or 1840, New York City was the first one, first city to develop an actual police force. There were no so-called police forces during the colonial period, during the period of the independent states. There were the militia. They had sheriffs, and they had constables, they had the officers, and then they had the militia, which was the great organizational structure in which everyone participated. So we moved completely away from that, and in moving completely away from that, that sovereign power has been taken away from the people. A little piece of it's been put over here in the army, a little piece of it's been put over here in the National Guard, another piece of it's been put over here in all of these uh, police agencies which respond to uh, some local jurisdictional body or perhaps the governor, if you're talking about a state police agency. And the ability of the people themselves to exercise sovereignty, or even to threaten to exercise sovereignty, right? How do you keep usurpers in line? By the threat that if they start usurping, the people are going to take direct action against them. Right? All of that has been removed from the system. In practice. Not in principle, because it's all there still in principle. There hadn't been an amendment of the Constitution to change any of this. They have just surreptitiously or foolishly created alternative institutions which have, by accretion or absorption, gained these powers which should be in the hands of the people themselves. And so as a result of this, now Virginia is an example, actually many states are an example of this, now we see the attempt to eliminate entirely the ability of the people to function as militia. Right? They want to disarm them completely. And they start off with what? They start off with the quintessential militia firearms, the so-called assault firearms, the ones that could be used to perform the basic three functions of the militia. Let's get rid of those. And once we get rid of those, then the next thing we can do is we'll begin to, to eliminate larger and larger numbers of the other types of firearms. We'll come up with rationalizations for that. And in the final analysis, the people will be in a position, well, they may have a sporting firearm, they may have a you know, shotgun for shooting skeet, they may have a twenty two caliber rifle for shooting targets, and so forth. Uh, but they will not be in a position to exercise the power of sovereignty. Someone else will have that. That will be in the standing army, that will be in the... National Guard and state standing armies that will be in the local standing armies, the professional police, but the people will not have it. And then at that stage, all bets are off in terms of all the other freedoms that the Constitution is supposed to guarantee, because there will be no way to enforce them.
And that brings you back to the Declaration of Independence. But that's exactly what the Declaration of Independence says. You get to the situation, there's a long series, a long yes. train of abuses and usurpations. And what must the people at that stage do? Well, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. Well, how are you going to do that as individuals? It's inconceivable. And so what they're doing, if you look at this thing, they're attempting to unravel through gun control as a classic example of this process. They're attempting to unravel the entire structure of constitutional free government. And fortunately, what we're seeing in Virginia is people, to a certain extent, are waking up to that. They're saying this is not simply a matter of they want to take away my so-called high-capacity magazine or they want to take away my AR-15 or make me register it, some kind of onerous requirement. But their goal is more insidious, more pernicious than that. Once they take away these firearms, then what else will they do? Well, why would they take away their firearms unless they had some, uh, what shall we say, uh, uh, unacceptable ideas? of what they're going to do. And I find it fascinating to see the arguments. I think maybe Biden made this argument as well. You know, you don't need these guns to defend against. You can't defend against tyranny, right? Because the government has jet planes and tanks and so forth and so on. And I don't know. Do the Afghan, do the Taliban, do they have jet planes and tanks? And I thought they were in caves with rifles and so forth. And they've been going at it for, what, 14 years? They haven't been defeated. Uh, but Biden made that statement. And then, of course, I would have asked Biden, well, if the average American can't defend his liberties against you know, tyrannical government, why are you so set on taking the guns he has away from him? Right? If he can't use them anyway, if they're ineffective, why do you want to take them away? And the answer is, well, because anyone that's looked at the history of the 20th century realizes, wait a minute, partisan warfare, guerrilla warfare, use whatever other adjectives you want, can be extremely successful. Especially when the, a large percentage of the population is on the side of the partisans or the guerrillas and against the government of usurpers and tyrants. And that was, of course, the position of the, of the founders in this country. You arm the people for exactly that reason. So there's where we are. Uh, and I look at this, you know, the, the, the glass is half full or half empty. I thought for a while it was less than half full because the gun controllers simply kept advancing. Now you can understand in California they're going to advance, in New York they're going to, in Maryland they're going to advance. But it was a little difficult to believe that they were going to advance in a place like Virginia. And then all of a sudden, oops, they came up with this Bloombergization strategy. Mm. And the next thing you knew, uh, it looked as if they had a good chance to put in laws that were even more draconian than the one in Maryland. I mean, the, this, the law that was proposed by Mr. Saslaw in the Senate and Mr. Levine in the House was for, for actual prohibition. Yes of the so-called assault firearms. We're going to take those all away. That was, the law in, in Maryland and New York and Connecticut doesn't prohibit the possession. So you simply have to register them. All right? So they thought they could get away with something that even New York hadn't passed. Mm -hmm. And they discovered the opposite is true. So now I think the glass is more than half full. In fact, the glass seems to be increasingly full. But we'll see. All right? the, the grave danger here is always that people go back to sleep. Right? They think, oh, we've done all we need to do. Now we don't worry. We'll go back to sleep. But meanwhile, in the back room, their opponents are plotting the next stage in their, in their plan. Evil never sleeps. Okay? Good men often do, but evil never sleeps. And the first rule in politics is to have a very healthy distrust of the purposes and goals of others. All right? They may not be actively working against our interests, but they're thinking of it. And when they get the opportunity, they'll take, they'll take action. And I think Virginia is a classic example because between the, the election election 
And the introduction of these bills uh, was a very short period of time, hmm. a couple of weeks. And you look at some of the bills, they're extremely detailed. Mm-hmm. They say, where did these come from? Oh, well, they came from some think tank, some Bloomberg think tank. These were all in the can, as they say in Hollywood. They used to say of films, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, the film is in the can. All of these things were in the can, waiting for the opportunity. The opportunity came, they came out, they put them on, in the hopper, and the legislative process begins. So they're ready to do that, essentially, in every state, every locality. I'm sure they have the bills uh, drafted appropriately. Just waiting for the opportunity to, to gain enough uh, you know, voting power in the legislature to do this. And as I've said to people, the only way to solve this problem, ultimately, is to revitalize. That's the word I like to use, revitalize, because they're not dead. They're asleep. Revitalize the militia structures in this country. Because as soon as you do that, essentially all of this gun control will disappear. It would be impossible to have it. For the simple reason that almost any gun that I can imagine from the 20th century could be used for some militia function. You just think back to, you know what the Liberator pistol was? Remember that? Mm-hmm. It was this little sheet metal thing that was made, I think it was by the Guide Light, Guide Lamp Division of General Motors because they knew how to make sheet metal and spot weld. Single shot, little pistol, used a 45 ACP round. And the idea was these things were going to be dropped to resistance fighters in Europe, Occupy Europe. And the resistance fighter would take that little gun, single shot gun, and he'd shoot a German with it and take a better gun. Well, you look at that particular gun, you say, would that suffice in some way to advance the common defense? And the answer is, well, yes, it would, because they were going to produce those and deliver them to resistance fighters. And you can imagine a situation in this country where there was an invasion and some part of the country was taken over by the foreign conquerors and the people there had to resist. And maybe the only thing they would have is this single shot pistol. So if even that single shot pistol would be conducive to performing the functions of a militia, what wouldn't be? That's why I find it amazing when I talk to this, a lot of these Second Amendment proponents who are very much enamored of the Heller decision and the individual right to keep and bear arms. I said, well, wait a minute. Your individual right to keep and bear arms is constantly being attacked on the basis of the particular gun. Right. right? You, can't have the, you can't have the so-called assault rifle. You can't have the uh, pistol that can take the magazine of over 10 rounds, blah, 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 whatever it is. There is no limit to these attacks. And all they amount to ultimately is, well, how do the, how do the, uh, the, the electorate and people who are elected feel about this. It's kind of the feel-bad legislation, right? We don't like somebody to have more than 10 rounds, so we feel bad about it. We've got to outlaw this. These will be unending battles. This will go on from now until the end of time if you litigate these questions or oppose gun control on this basis. Whereas if you go to the Constitution and say, oh, wait a minute, the, the arms that we're talking about here are ones that have to that are conducive to a well-regulated militia. There's basically no category of arms that doesn't perform or couldn't perform that function. And that's the end of the game for the gun controllers. And that's why the gun controllers never bring this up. That's why the gun controllers are as much uh, reticent about bringing up the case of the United States versus Miller, for instance. They don't want to talk about that. Because as soon as you start talking about militia and common defense, and you start looking about at the history, just in the 20th century, of what was used for the common defense, or what could be used today for various aspects of militia service, the gun control argument falls apart completely. The only place where it continues to have any, would continue to have any relevance is dealing with people who are mentally defective. And we know that the militia structures from the earliest days, they were all based on the concept of people being able-bodied. Mm-hmm. If you weren't able-bodied, you weren't going to be enrolled in the militia. Now, that didn't mean that you couldn't have a gun, but you weren't going to be enrolled in the militia. And primarily that dealt with people who were 
what I would call superannuated. I mean, you had some people who were crippled in one way or another, uh, blind, so they couldn't perform the function. But you get to people who were 50 years old, 55, 60 years of age during that period, 1700s, large percentage of the 1800s, uh, they were subject to uh, incurable disease. Or they had some kind of accident that couldn't be straightened out one way or another. And so they couldn't perform the function. And I think it's a basic uh, rule of fairness that you can't demand of someone a function that you can't perform. So today, if you think about that, say, well, who would be in the militia? Well, take Virginia. Virginia's militia statute, everyone from 16 to 55. Wait a minute. A 16-year-old in Virginia can't buy a firearm. How's that possible? They have one rule that says 16 years of age, you remember the militia, and they have other statutes that say if you're 16, 17 years of age, you can't buy a firearm. How's that possible? When a member of the militia is supposed to have a firearm. So you see these kinds of anomalies mm-hmm. that would all be straightened out. Now, of course, they'd require that the militia statutes be revamped so that when a, someone became 16 years old, he would actually be enrolled in some kind of a program. Right? Sure. This isn't just an abstraction. And in fact, it would be even earlier. Because if you're going to go into the militia at 16, when you're 15, 14, 13, you should be taking some courses in school. Oh, and let's start off with the principles. Let's start teaching you the Declaration of Independence. Let's start teaching you the Constitution. Why is it that you're going at 16 years of age to become a member of the militia? Well, it's because of these legal principles. Oh, my goodness. What would the National Education Association say about teaching those things? <laughs> well, you see, there'd be a complete revolution here. Not simply in, in the area of gun control, which would disappear, but in terms of something as prosaic, if you will, as public education, which teaches none of this. I mean, even I went to Harvard Law School. And I had as my professor Archibald Cox. You remember him? Yes. He was the special prosecutor in the Watergate case with Nixon until Nixon fired him. They had the big brouhaha over the firing. But he was an extremely well-known, high-profile individual. And I had him as my constitutional law professor. What was interesting about that course was we never once sat down and actually read the Constitution. I would have thought the first I think we came in on a Wednesday. It was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I, we came in and started on Wednesday. And I thought what he was going to do was say, between now and Friday, I want everyone to read the Constitution so at least we'll know what the document is that we're going to be talking about. We never did. He never asked anyone to read the Constitution. This is Harvard Law School. Hmm. All right? With, with somebody who was a, a, a person, a high-profile professor, now, not some underling that had just shown up there. So, of course, you know, in, in undergraduate and certainly in, in high school, middle school, and so forth, none of this stuff is taught. Well, the reason it would be taught if you revitalize the militia would be, well, these people are going into the militia. They bloody well better know what the basis of their service is going to be, why they're doing this, and what they need to know. And, of course, then you'd start very young with the people training with firearms, training with air rifles, air pistols, 22 rifles, and so forth, and so on, because as soon as they get to be 16 years of age, they better know all the rules of safety and functionality and so forth and so on. They're going to be using firearms on a regular basis. I would imagine that within a few years, the national sport would be the use of firearms. be like Switzerland used to be. <sighs> all right? And then people would... This would generate a whole new ethos of responsibility, Community responsibility. Think of you know welfare functions. Well, now if you have a militia structure, and everywhere your community is broken up into these groups of fifty, sixty, seventy people that form a particular militia company, and they know what's going on with their neighbors. They know if Jim has a drinking problem. They know if the Smith family maybe is in financial some financial difficulties. What have you? you know, these these personal problems, if you will. And I would imagine that that militia structure would very quickly develop internal mechanisms and procedures for dealing with those problems. You solve them right there at the local level. You don't have some huge bureaucracy Mm 
at the state or the national level dealing with these kinds of problems. They're solved by the local militia groups themselves. Why? Because those people have been trained, if you want to use that word, made aware is better, that everyone has a social responsibility. We are not here as individuals. If you're living in society, you are not an isolated individual. You have responsibilities to others, and others have responsibilities to you, and that's the only way you're going to make society function, especially in difficult times, especially when you have real emergency situations, natural disasters being the classic example of it. And so you're going to generate that kind of ethos, and that's going to be generated from when? From the time, well, maybe the child's 12 years old, maybe 11 years old, who knows how early. As soon as they can, as soon as they can appreciate what you're saying to them, you begin generating this process. And what does that eventually create? Well, it creates the opposite of cultural Marxism. Because cultural Marxism is based upon the proposition, or, or, or their goal is to generate despondency in society, ultimately despair, the belief that nothing works, everything is rotten, and therefore we have to impose some kind of Marxism. Right? That's going to solve all of our problems. That's the plan of cultural Marxism. And they've been very successful. Right? It's, it's cultural pessimism with respect to the society in which we're living. Well, the militia structure is, is such that it would generate cultural optimism. We can do it. Our destinies are in our hands. Mm -hmm. We can function in a progressive manner, to use the word progressive in the, with the correct connotation to it which we don't have now. Right? We have this atomization. And sometimes it's atomization even within families. Right. I mean, pe people don't know who lives across the street from them in many neighborhoods. Well, they know that's Mr. Smith, but that's essentially all they know about Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith or the Smith children. Whereas if they were all in, in that particular neighborhood, they would be a particular militia group, militia company, let's call it. He would, uh, Smith would get to know Jones pretty well, pretty quickly. Right. They'd have an idea of, of how they could depend on each other, what their skills and abilities were, what kind of personalities they were, because why? They'd be dealing with each other on a regular basis, performing these, performing these functions. So you can see all sorts of what I would call ancillary benefits to this kind of a structure, which most people don't recognize at all. They, when they think of militia, they think of a bunch of guys standing around with guns, you know, marching or wearing camouflage outfits and go out in the woods or some darn thing. Well, that would be part of it, obviously, because that's part of the function, the paramilitary or military function. But that would be the young ones. <laughs> I would, with the knees I have, I certainly would not be able to perform those functions very well. I'd be doing something else. Even some person perhaps who was uh, you know, paraplegic. Let's take that as an example, a classic example of someone who could not function in a traditional militia role. But the guy is, is an expert in, in IT. We put him in front of a computer. There's plenty of things he can do. Huh? Maybe it might be only one hour a week for him. But he would see himself as part of this bigger structure, contributing to social stability and social preservation of a free state. Right, in which his contribution was something more important than simply every now and then going out and voting for some politician whom he really didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then hoping the politician didn't stab him in the back with some kind of a baneful legislation. So that's what, <clears throat> from my perspective, I'd look at this and say, you know, these Second Amendment people are really, in, in a sense, they are more dangerous than the gun control people because the gun control people really do understand what they want and what they need and what they, what, what they intend to do, whereas the pro-Second Amendment people really don't. They don't have a clear understanding of what that amendment was meant to do and why it's important, not simply from the point of view of having a firearm for the things that they those individuals want, right? Personal protection, of course, you can have that. Uh, sports shooting, well, of course, you can have that, right? Go down that whole list. It's for this other purpose, and a, and a purpose that may transcend the actual use of firearms. Think of all the things that would be done by a militia in, in the course of a uh, natural disaster. 
which firearms would have play no no role. Think of what I said before, but the social welfare f- functions of of militia units, in which firearms would play no role whatsoever. The educational aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I also play some role there, but the important thing is to get people understanding what the structure of their polity really is, right? which they don't. Right. As I say, I went to Harvard Law School. I've never taught. That. You think in a law school they would teach you that? <laughs> Any law school, but certainly Harvard Law School. No, they didn't. We didn't. Never read the Constitution. Amazing, and it's certainly not done in high schools. No. And it's certainly not done in middle schools. No. All right. None of that is done. Well, now you, you know. Let, let the let the listeners to this sit back sometime with a glass of wine and imagine all the possibilities that a structure of that nature could be put to to accomplishing. It's um, mind-boggling. And of course, we've lost all that. You have more than well. How, let's see. Nineteen oh three was really the the death knell of the thing because they they invented this concept called the unorganized militia, which is everyone who isn't in the National Guard. Uh, so we're talking about a century. We've lost an entire century in truly progressive social organization in this country. And we've let the crazies, the Marxists, the most failed political philosophy in the history of the world, take over our educational system, dominate our political system, dominate our media, and then we wonder why things are going to hell in a handbasket without the handbasket. And it's, it's the thing that amazes me, if you read the bloody Constitution, it's right there on the face of the document. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you have to know a little history. You have to know, well, what is a militia, and so forth and so on, and put yourself back into that period of time and try to understand things, and especially the meaning of words, the way the founders did, and come to some comprehension of why they put it together this way. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't kind of cut and paste. Uh, you know, somebody said this, well, we put that there, we just paid, we've got an empty space here in the parchment, let's just write something. No, wrong. It was a comprehensively organized document based on a, what well, I would say it was amazing political insights that these people had. But they were all, to a certain extent, political scholars, scholars of history. So it isn't surprising if you look back at the, the personalities that were there. And so here it is. And what we've done is we, we've lost that patrimony. It was all of this wisdom embodied in this document and then you know, behind the document, the things that were behind the document. And for 100 years, at least, the Civil War was also another example of that happening in a very bad event, but let's just go from the 1900s on, 1900 on. We, for a hundred years, we've let this thing escape us, elude us, and now we're suffering these consequences. And I can point my finger to almost any one of these untoward consequences. Well, we wouldn't have that. We most likely wouldn't have that, or at least certainly not to that degree, if we had an actual militia structure here. Think of the, you know, think of the situation of gangs, city gangs, Violence, drive-by shootings, drug selling, and so forth and so on. Drug trafficking. Kids join gangs because they don't have strong families, number one. Number two, because they want companionship, because they want some kind of leadership, because they want to feel that they're part of an organizational structure that's doing something you think if we had militia structures which would pick these people up from the time they were, let's say, 13, 14 years old, early education, and then put them into the system by the time they were 16 or 15 years old in Massachusetts, actually, what used to be, but say 16 years old on up, that we wouldn't very quickly eliminate the gang problem? Why haven't the inner, these inner city governors or large city governors, uh, mayors, excuse me, not the, the mayors, thought about this. They're, play, they're plagued with this. Chicago, Baltimore, you, you go down the list of these, these cities, and not a single one of them ever says, well, you know, maybe if we, if we looked at the Constitution and we did this, we might begin to get a handle on control of this situation. 
And I think I'm not saying that the, the, the problems are the result necessarily of bad faith on the part of these politicians. I think a lot of it is ignorance. Right? They're not. <laughs> they didn't go to Harvard Law School. If they had gone to Harvard Law School, they wouldn't have learned anything about the Constitution. Right? They don't learn this. They don't know this. And it's amazing how many people, lawyers I talk to about this have never heard of any, of any of this. It's just incredible. Well, we, as you pointed out, there are layers of loss. We have, we've lost the uh, practice in the majority of the strong family and, and the uh, commitment to having children, raising children, uh, bringing them up with uh, intact values. And then you, you layer on top of that the loss of a, a century plus loss of understanding of the true intention uh, and wisdom of our constitutional uh, structure and how it could serve to empower and to give appropriate responsibility and and um, effectiveness to the common people. And, that, and then you start to see just hosts and hosts of problems uh, that uh, can plague a society that has lost its its spiritual, moral, family, and uh, and properly structured uh, social roots and 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 then then the, the remedies become increasingly egregious. Then um, we've I see that we're over an hour, and uh, that was our first introductory question of what's going on in in Virginia, and the second question of what's the proper role of and the confusion around the role of the Second Amendment. Um, we'll need to circle back with you about your book. Uh, by tyranny out of necessity and the unconstitutionality of martial law, as well as viewers' questions. Sure. And uh, just thank you for joining us here on Finance and Liberty and Reluctant Preppers. Well, thank you very much for having me. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your gold and silver and support this channel at goldsilver.com slash question mark AFF equals RP. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions.